volume. More volume. Marcus on me. There we go. Thank you. Welcome. Come on in, take a piece of shade. Grab some breeze. Pull up a chair or a carpet. Get comfortable. It's good to have you here in the coming side yard. Our revived, modified church location for the summer. Let me just open with a word of prayer as you gather yourselves and get comfortable. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for summertime. We thank you for the seasons, for the beauty that each one brings, and how we see your hand and your fingerprints in the world that you've given to us. Thank you for this place that you've blessed us with. Thank you for the comings who are so gracious to let us gather here. For those at home, we ask a special blessing on them as well. May, be, may they be refreshed, even though there may not be breezes that we have. May they also feel your presence, Holy Spirit. We commit this time, these people, all who have a role into your hands, Lord. Thank you for them. And we ask that you would bless each one. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And just to let you know, there are only three more Sundays left where we will be meeting at this location for the outside church service. Yeah. God has been so faithful and gracious to bless us with nice weather every Sunday we've been outside. So that's great. But three more, August, August the 14th, August 21st, and August the 28th. All right. So at the end of August, once August is finished, we're back at the United Church location on Kincardine Street. Please check your emails. If there's any rain dates, it will be sent out by Saturday at 6 p.m. All right, so if there is rain on Saturday, you'll get an email that says we've canceled church here, but we'll be meeting at the actual building. Okay, so we'll meet back at the church. And if we meet at the church, remember, it's 11.15. The service starts at 11.15 if we're at the church. If we're outside, it's 10 o'clock. On Wednesday... From 7 a.m. till 8 a.m. at the McCallums, they're still having prayer and coffee time. So this week, for this week, yes. The next two weeks after that, McCallums will not be there, so you'll be sitting on the step not drinking coffee. But this week, one more time, join them for coffee, 7 a.m. if you wish, for prayer time. YFC, Youth for Christ, has a few more weeks of summer camps left. So please, number one, talk to Rebecca. If you want more details about that, she's waving her hand there, right in the middle. You can see Rebecca, Rebecca Goulet. Or two, you can view your emails for the updates on the YFC summer camps that are left, what's happening. All right? Important to notice as well, you may remember this, that we've mentioned, that um, there is a leadership team meeting this Wednesday. It's also combined with a congregational meeting, so two meetings at once. We're getting uh, smarter in our wisdom and age to do these things together. So congregational meeting and leadership team meeting at the church this Wednesday, 7 p.m. Everyone is welcome, all right? But only members will be allowed and encouraged to vote on issues. You are free to discuss any issues that are brought up at these meetings, but only members will be voting, okay? So this Wednesday, 7 p.m., please put it on your calendars. It's at the church, okay? Congregational meeting at the church this Wednesday. Pastor Bruce is preaching next Sunday. He's here with us today, but he will he's on holidays technically, and uh, he will be preaching next Sunday. After that, he's on vacation for the next two weeks. So the 14th and 21st, uh, we have myself and Alec coming, filling in. But next Sunday, Pastor Bruce is here, and then after that, you can decide if you want to hear me or Alec. Or just wait for Pastor Bruce to return in September. <laughs> Don't do that. Alec will feel badly. I'll feel badly. Just show up to church. It's always good to be in church, no matter who's speaking. The Holy Spirit works, and you'll learn something. We're going to turn it over to the music group to lead us in song and worship. So it's all to you guys. Thank you for serving the Lord in this way. I want to encourage you to just let your body know that you are here to worship the Lord. If that means looking up into the trees while we sing, if it means standing up to stretch out your hands or your arms, however, positioning your body reminds your full self, hey, this is all about God. I encourage you to take a position of worship in yourself as we start. We dedicate this song to Birgit, who asked specifically for She's going to be singing the loudest of all. be 
is down in our soul is a bunch of dry twigs and dead leaves, then that is the perfect place for fire. If all that is left of us feels like old summer grass, that's when the harvest comes. So thank you that you meet us where we're at, and we don't have to pretend with you. We often pretend with ourselves. We pretend with others, but with you, you already know us. So we just take a minute to do a little inventory and go, yeah, this is where I'm at. Thank you that your fire can meet me right where I am.
Thank you, Lord, that our feelings inform us. They have a space. We acknowledge how we're feeling, and yet we exhort ourselves with your word that you will not let go. Thank you that our feelings are welcome, and your truth meets our feelings to bring us to a space where we can trust you.
Father, what a comforting thought, what a joyous thought to know that we are yours. You are the only true and good God, and we marvel in your goodness this day. We are your people. You are ours, and we are yours. Thank you for that truth, Jesus. Holy Spirit, continue to draw us closer to that goodness, to your throne of grace, to who you are, so that we might understand how we can be more like you. May we leave here closer to you than when we came in a deeper understanding of who we are to you and how much you truly, really deeply love us. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. At this point, I'll release the children or dismiss the children. And uh, they are free to head around to the other side of the house, thank you to our Sunday school leaders and helpers who are willingly giving up their time to minister to the children. That's probably where Jesus would be too, so thank you for that. We appreciate you. And as they're leaving, we will be thinking of any prayer requests or praise items that we might have. We have 
Henri and Patricia D'Souza, who are celebrating an anniversary this week. So we'll consider that a praise item. I'll pray for them. And uh, I'll be praying for Reuben as well, who will be bringing forth the message this day and teaching us from the Word of God in a few moments. Anything else, Birgit? All right, I will, as you mentioned the prayer request, I'm going to pray for them right away. I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray for it right now. So we'll be having three or four short prayers instead of one big longer one at the end. Birgit's just asked for a, a young friend who was attempted suicide this week. I'm going to pray for that person just now. Lord, we know that you know all things, and you know who this person is that Birgit has concerns on her heart for and who has been able to help and Lord, I just pray that you would protect this person's mind with the truth of the fact that you love them, that he or she was made in your image, and that they're made for a purpose, and that, Lord, you have a reason for them being here, and I just pray that any thoughts of suicide would be taken away and completely abolished, that they would be break, broken free of that bondage that they're in, and that the person would only hear your truth, Jesus. If it comes through Birgit or through someone else, I pray that it would happen soon. Protect this person's life, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Brett. Okay. Heavenly Father, we lift up our brother and friend, John Rabbi. Lord, you know what happened to him this week and the details of what he's going through right now with his fall. Lord, whatever extent of his injuries, I pray that as you are the great physician, we implore you to reach out and have your hand of healing upon him. Restore his spirit, Lord. Strengthen him in mind as well and encourage him. May he know that he has a family of, of friends and believers here who are praying for him and lifting him up. We ask that you would be very close to him this week, Lord, and heal his body. We pray in Jesus' name. Mary. Um, for my friend Connie and Mike, Mike is still quite ill, and, um, and Connie is still is waiting for heart surgery. Their farm is sold, which is a praise item, I guess. Uh, and they move in April, they, so they have time to find a place, they just need to find something. So I just okay. pray that they'll find what, something that suits both their needs. Okay. Heavenly Father, we think of Connie and Mike, and uh, we've prayed for them before, Lord. We, we know that you are still working in their lives, and Lord, we, we know that Mike is ill. We just uh, lift him up, and again, bring him to your healing hands, Jesus. Connie, who's waiting for surgery for her heart, Lord, we pray that you would be in those details that would be able to move her along on that list so that she could get the surgery she needs. As well, Heavenly Father, we give you the details of their, their farm that has been sold and the need that they have to find a new house, a new home. I pray that you would um, oversee those details, things that are out of their control and things that they can't even foresee, and you would bring them to a new place quickly. I know they'll be careful to give you the praise and honor and glory, as will Mary and Alec, as we see your hand moving in their lives. Lift this family up to you, Jesus. In your holy name I pray. All right, Connie, you're welcome from Chatham, Ontario. Glad to have you with us this day. And uh, you are being prayed for and covered. Aww. One more. Yes. Uh, so I have two prayers, and I guess praise for that. Um, a little praise. So um, I found um, a roommate, and she's Christian. And she has the same beliefs as I do. And like, the way like, we kind of blend together Christianly. Like she takes showers and we do. <laughs> God is in the details. Yeah, I know. And um, I guess like a prayer request for um, for water shortages. And the last one is that I get all the items that, that I need for August and that I find friends, college, you know, that kind of, I guess, resemble me. Not physically, I mean, like, you know, oh yeah. All right. God is in the details, Melina. Let's pray for that. 
Heavenly Father, we rejoice with Melina. We thank you that she has found a roommate and someone who is a Christian, a believer, who has similar beliefs as to what she has. Lord, I pray that that relationship would work out and it would glorify you, that they would be able to edify each other and become stronger in their faith together. Heavenly Father, we lift up this need for water shortages around the world, not just here at home. Um, you are the God of this world. You created the, the water, the sources of it belong to you, the rivers, the creeks, the streams, the rains that come. Lord, we just look to you and we, we praise you as the Almighty One who is in control of all these things. Please bring the rains and the waters that are needed <clears throat> to the people, wherever they may be. And Lord, finally, we look to uh, for you and the details of school supplies for Malena and all those who would be returning to school, whether it's high school, elementary school, college or university. Lord, there are so many details that uh, need to fall into place in the lives of the young people. And I just pray that they would find their peace, their joy and strength in knowing that you are there with them walking through each step of the path that they have to take this year. We commit this time, this service into your hands. Be with Reuben as he comes to speak to us and teach us. Give him good recall of what you've laid on his heart, Lord. And I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would give us minds to hear and ears to hear and minds to understand and comprehend your word. And may you apply it to our lives, Heavenly Father. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Reuben, welcome to the pulpit. beginning was rationing them out but if everyone anyone wants their own copy that'd be great now's the time to get one yeah because i have a few extras and i don't want them but I'll, I'll ask that you uh don't uh you know like throw them away if you're not going to bring it home oh, okay that's another one. great thank you if you just don't leave them here you can either put them back here on the table so i can take them home or you can just bring them home but don't leave them here we don't want to leave a mess with the comings okay um Okay, so I'm going to be continuing my end times thing. So every time, oh, you need one? Okay, someone's coming. Okay. So anytime I'm, being, I'm going to be asked to come up here to take Bruce's place, I'm going to talk a little bit about the end times. And so far, I'm going to do a little summary. So we spoke about Jesus, okay? It, Jesus is the most important aspect of any doctrine, okay? It's with Jesus who we're united with. If you put your faith in Jesus, you are saved. Whatever you believe about other things are important, but not essential. Together, if you put your faith in Jesus, we're brothers and sisters in Christ and we're a family. We don't have to agree on everything, but Jesus unites us all, okay? And it's good to talk about things without being angry or anything like that, because together as a family, we're stronger, and it's Jesus. If you put your faith in Jesus, there's no other way to, to heaven or to the Father, it's through Jesus. And he's everywhere in the Bible. Old Testament, Genesis 1, 1 to the end, okay? So Jesus is central. Then we spoke about the church. The church starts, if you take a look at the little timeline that I have you, you have the cross. The church starts shortly after Jesus is crucified and, and rose again. Okay, so we spoke about that already. And the church is Gentiles, us, and Jewish people who put their faith in Christ. That's what the church is, Okay. Then we spoke about Israel. Israel is really, really important. It's probably the most important thing about how you view the end times. If you think Israel is maybe symbolic and doesn't apply anymore and doesn't apply in the future, that will affect how you read everything in the scriptures. Because you will replace Israel, uh, the church, the, you put the church where Israel is spoken about. I don't take that approach, but some people do. Israel for me is Israel, and this is what I taught. Uh, Israel has an important place in the future. And Israel is God's people. We don't have to agree with politics. We don't have to agree with everything they do. But we have to remember, I think, I have to remember that this is God's people, and there is a plan for them. Okay, so that's for that. And then we talked about the rapture. 
And the rapture is simply, we're going to be taken away and meet Jesus in the clouds. And we spoke a little bit about that and, and the, the verses that surround that. So the point that I'm doing by doing this is I'm taking all the aspects, saying, well, this is what the Bible says about it. And then later at the end, we'll put it all together. So once you believe these pieces, then it's up to us to put these pieces together and see how they fit with Scripture. Okay, so today we're talking about the tribulation. Just the tribulation. We're not going to get into the details of it, but we're just going to be talking about this time that's also called Jacob's trouble. It's called 53 different things in the Scriptures. And I'm going to say something that may be surprising you. You're going to have to check it out yourselves, and you should check things out yourself. Okay, Test me. Ask me questions, but check it out. But every time you see Day of Jehovah in the Old Testament, and every time you see Day of the Lord in the New Testament, it's talking about the tribulation period. So with that in mind, when you're reading stuff, take a look at it and see how that fits for you. And today's readings, we're going to be taking a look at Daniel, which is really important, key passage. Math, Matthew, when Jesus talks about the Great Tribulation and a little bit uh, in Revelation. We're not going into details, we're just talking about where these, the tribulation is spoken of and, a, and a, a little bit about it. So if you take a look at the chronology of, the, uh, of how things are, so the cross is where Jesus died and rose again, that's where the church starts, and then we have this dispensation of grace until the end of the tribulation. So if you take a look at that little chart, where I'm talking about the little seven year period right in the middle. And then there's a messianic kingdom, and then the aftermath. We'll be talking about that in another subject. So today we're just looking at that little period. And the point today is to say the tribulation is something that the Bible talks about. So whatever you want to do with it, see, do it with the scriptures in mind. All right, so Daniel. So next page, Daniel 77. I hope I get this one right. I've been I spoke of, I was speaking about this for a long time, and it gets confusing, but I think I got it down pat after so many years, okay? It's tricky. So what I'm going to do, this is Daniel's prophecy. So a little background about Daniel, okay? So Daniel lived about uh, 530 years before Jesus was born, all right? And uh, he's the guy, if you know anything about you know, Sunday school stories, the lion's den, huh? uh, the statue, he, his three friends didn't want to, they were thrown in the fiery furnace. Mm -hmm. Daniel. Daniel in the lion's den is probably maybe, maybe the most famous story, but that's the guy that we're talking about. So when he was 17, he got, you know, Jerusalem got trampled by the Babylonians, and he was taken with his friends into Babylon when he was 17. This part of the testimony of his prophecy is about 90 years old. When he was thrown in the lion's den, he was about 70 years old. Seven zero. So it's a long time. This is coming to the end of his life. And I'm like, in the beginning of Daniel, he tells us what he's doing. I haven't put that down in the paper, but he's reading Jeremiah. So he's reading Jeremiah, and he's still in captivity. Daniel had risen to a really great prominence in the Babylonian Empire. And uh, he He's taking a Sabbath, and he's uh, reading the Bible. And he said, okay, so I'm going to read Jeremiah. He's a prophet, right? And it's a contemporary prophet. So Jeremiah gave these things about 100 years before, and he, or maybe about 70 years before, and he prophesied. He's, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because he was trying to get Israel to repent. Say, if you're not going to repent, you know, you're going to be, God's going to you know, punish you. And that's what happened. Daniel is reading this, and he's reading in Daniel, and he's reading in Jeremiah 29.10. And he's reading, and he's saying, oh, it's only going to be for 70 years. I'm only, we're only going to be in captivity for 70 years. So he does the math and stuff like that. He said, well, there's only about three years to go. Jeremiah, I believe, that he believed that Jeremiah was a prophet. He said, well, Jeremiah is saying, I'm only, Israel's going to be in captivity for 70 years. It's coming up. So he gets into prayer, okay? Oh, Lord, you know, we repent. Uh, he's, he wants the Messianic kingdom to come. Lord, we, this is it. You know, we know that you're coming back for us, and, and we repent, we repent. 
And then Gabriel shows up, and this is paraphrasing, and he says, whoa, whoa, Daniel. I've got some news to tell you. Hold your horses here, okay? After he's told this, which we're going to read, Daniel goes into depression, and you'll see why. So here he is. He's expecting Israel to be rescued by the Messiah. And Gabriel, the angel, the same Gabriel that visited Mary, says, whoa, hold on. So this, let's read this together. We're going to read it once, and then we're going to try to break it down, okay? Seventy-sevens have been decreed for your people and your holy city. So seventy-sevens. To finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So your people being the Jews. So the 77th period that's anointed for the Israel. Okay? So you are to know and discern, so in verse 25, that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, this is the first time Messiah, the word Messiah, is used in the Old Testament. Messiah the Prince, there will be seven years, seven sevens, and six to two sevens. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the six to two sevens, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. And even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with many for one seven. But in the middle of the seven, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction. One of this is the decree is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So there's, there's three time blocks, right? Did you get it? There's one seven seven, there's one sixty two seven, and there's one seven. Yeah. And if you guys turn the page, you're going to see a little bit uh, of uh, a little diagram. Some, some versions have weeks, 70, 70 weeks. The weeks is not real weeks. The, the real Hebrew word is sevens. It's been translated sometimes in weeks and sometimes in sevens, but and how do I know? Well, a Jewish guy said it. And secondly, I just wanted to bring this up. This is a side point. When you're doing a, side, when you're doing a Bible study, uh, a Bible concordance is really key. So when, especially when every version of the Bible is good, a, a bit, so, well, I don't know them all. I don't know them all. But some of them are word-for-word -word translations, and some are word-for-thought. And they're all good. I mean, it's going to get you to read the Bible. It's going to get you to read the Bible. But the ones that are word-for-word -word sometimes have broken English because they're word-for-word, -word and it kind of doesn't make sense. But those are the ones, if you're going to make a, a theological decision on, you got to make sure what the Bible really says. You can't expect someone else to put their thoughts on what it means, because they're going to be a little bit subjective, right? Yeah. So later on, after the service, I'll show you exactly if you get a Bible concordance. It's like 30 bucks. It's one of the best things i ever had. You don't have to know Hebrew, but every single word that's in these word-for-word -word translations is in these concordance, and you can look up the definitions. Okay, and I'll show you how after the after service if you want, but it's a key. So it's 77, okay? So total 77 and we know it's years because just prior to that he's talking about well we don't know it's years but i'm telling you it's years <laughs> no no i don't show you why but prior to that he was talking about uh, years right 70 years and in, in, in things so this whole year business is coming and when we look at the prophecy how it's fulfilled we're going to see that it's pretty amazing I was, this, this prophecy is fulfilled, okay? So it's a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. We know that the decree was set in 40, 445 BC. It's recorded in the scriptures and also recorded in private historical accounts, okay? It was to rebuild Jerusalem and the moats and the walls, okay? There's a decree. There's actually four of them, but there was only one of them that had this whole thing to do, okay? And there's six things 
at the end of the 70 year period, the 490 year period, that's going to happen. There's three negative and three positive. One, and it's all about Israel. One is to finish the rebellion of the Jews. Two is, and this is from what we're reading here, to finish transgression, to make an end of sin. No more sin in Israel when these seven, seven years are done. When it says to make atonement for iniquity is to make atonement. What Israel did was rejecting the Messiah. They're going to make atonement for rejecting the Messiah. To bring in everlasting righteousness is literally to bring in an age of righteousness in for Israel. And to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place is to com bring complete fulfillment of all the prophecy concerning Israel. And then it's to anoint the new temple, the holy place. So those are the six things that in verse 24 it tells us what's going to happen at the end of the 770s. So 7 times 7 is 490 periods, which is our years. Huh? We're good? All right. So in verse 25. So you're discerning that from the issuing of a decree to restore Christian and Messiah the Prince. And two things are happening here. Issuing of the decree and Messiah the Prince. Messiah. Okay. There will be seven sevens for the issuing of the decree to restore Israel. And there will be 62 sevens for the return of Messiah. Right? So 77 is going to be 49 years to re rebuild the, the temple. And there's going to be, I want to get it right, 460 something years to for the Messiah to come. And, uh, it's, it's in your little diagram on your second page. 424. So there's two, two periods that are being spoken about here. Building of the temple and the Messiah coming. In verse 26, then after the Messiah comes, then after the 62 sevens, the 424, the Messiah will be cut off. He will be killed and have nothing. Then after this happens, okay, the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So who is this prince? We're going to be talking about a couple of issues in, in, in Israel's past, which had a terrible tribulation throughout the history. But who is this prince? Daniel uh, has already identified this prince as the Antichrist in chapter 7 and 8. All right? But we're not going to go there because we're just talking about the tribulation. Right? And even to the end shall be war, if, and Israel has never possessed their land totally. So even to the end of, of the 77th, there will be war. Let's look at verse 7, the last 7. So there's three periods of time, right? 7 sevens, 62 sevens, and then the last period, 1 7, in verse 27. And he will make a firm covenant with many for 1 7. But in the middle of the 7, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And then the wing of abominations is a really important word because we're going to look at it soon. Will come one who makes desolate, even one, until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So in the middle of this last segment of sevens, he will break his covenant. He will put a stop to sacrifice. That means he's going to stop uh, the, uh, the, the sacrifice in the temple. There's not going to be any more sacrifices in the temple in the middle of the seven. And he's going to set up an abomination. So he makes a covenant for one seven, he breaks it in the middle, and we'll see what happens here, okay? So if you take a quick look at those little, the Daniel 70 weeks period here on your, on your paper here, the first seven weeks, command of the rebuilding of the Jerusalem. The 62 seven, the 62 sevens, the Messiah is presented. 
You know what date that sets up to? That the date is when Messiah, Jesus, rode on, into Jerusalem on the donkey. Why is that important? Because that's a messianic promise, that the Messiah will run into, run, ride into Jerusalem on the donkey, which is hugely crazy because usually conquering heroes go on horses. A donkey, pretty low, right? So this is what the Messiah, and this is why a lot of Jews at the time were welcoming him to come back in. The Pharisees and, and the, the religious leaders did not like this at all, but they were welcomed. So that was the presentation of the Messiah. You know what? So we know the dates, okay, from history. After the seven sevens, that date is exactly when the temple was rebuilt, or when the walls in Jerusalem were rebuilt. Jesus rolled in, and you can do this, okay, so... It's a bit complicated, and I try to do this with other people, but the, the numbers get a bit funny because there's a lot of becauses. <laughs> Israel has 300, a prophetic year is 360, uh, 360 days. So anytime the Bible talks about a year is 360 days, the Jewish calendar is set on 360 days. We only had the 365-day period about 40 years before Jesus was born. So we can't calculate the times using our, cal uh, our calendar because it just doesn't work because obviously Daniel was using his own calendar, right? If you add that, Jesus rode on to, into Jerusalem in April 6, 32 AD. Some people break it down even more to the exact hour, the hour where people were bringing in their, 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 uh, their the sheep for sacrifice into because it's Palm Sunday, four days before Passover, all Jewish nations that had to select their male sheep, unblemished, put them on their back, go into the the, 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 the temple to get them sacrificed. They chose the best one for their, their sins. Some people have this calculated to the exact time that that happens. It is so crazy, but we're not going to get into it today, but these two periods happen to the exact time. But Daniel was like 490. Well, yeah. So I'll tell you that right now. Daniel was, the question was, how long was Daniel was? So Daniel's prayer was 538 B.C. Okay. So 500 years before Jesus rode in, more than that, he made this prediction. He made this prediction prior to the, the Jerusalem being rebuilt. Jeremiah made the prediction that Israel is going to be let go 70 years before. Like the years before, like after 70 years, you're going to be beaten. That's exactly what happened. One thing to talk about when we talk about prophecies and stuff like that, the Bible is true. If you can't, it's accurate. It, and it, it's amazingly so when, when you start looking at the details. When we're looking in the future, we have to be careful because we don't know the future. I mean, obviously, Daniel saw, you know, Jeremiah's prophecy and he picked it up right away. But how come he didn't know it before, right? Why? Because, you know, over time, he's 90 years old, he's reading, he's learning, we're all going to learn all over our life, and things start to hit us as we're in study, as we're studying God's Word, really key for this whole process. Well, if you take a look at that page, the last seven-year period is broken up into two, right in a half, three and a half years. So I hope I got this Daniel 77s okay. Any questions on that? We're, we're kind of clear on that? At least the presentation that I gave you. You don't have to agree with it, but I'll be clear on what I said? Yes, All right. No? Yeah? All right. Now we're going to move on to the all of the discourse. So on another page on your presentation. Really, really key for us. A lot of people use this for the end times. Okay, it's Matthew 24. We all heard about that. Three Gospels record it. Matthew is the only one that records the three questions. The other two Gospels take the last two questions and they sum it up in the end times, okay? But we're going to break it down and we only want to talk about the tribulation period in regard to Matthew 24. Because that's what we're doing today. Tribulation only. We're starting it up. I believe you have it, Matthew 24, 1 to 3. So Jesus left the temple area and was going on his way when the disciples came up to point out the temple buildings around him. Okay, he's going to say, oh, look at this, it's really beautiful. And Jesus said to them, do you see, do you not see all these things? 
Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. Everything's going to be destroyed, he said. You see how beautiful this is? It's all gone. And in verse 3, and as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, that's why it's called the Olivet Discourse, the disciples came to him privately. They asked him three questions. Matthew records three questions. Tell us, when will these things happen? This temple of destruction. What will be the sign of your coming? And, and what is the sign of the end of the age? Two ages for the, the Jewish people is the present age and the messianic age. All right, so when is the sign of this age? So Jesus, he answered these questions, and, it, and you have to carefully study how he answered these things. But this is, I'm going to start with the tribulation, because that's what we're talking about. So when he's answering about the tribulation, about the, uh, the sign of your coming, it starts in verse 15. And he starts off in the middle of the week. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, just read that, right? Mm -hmm. right? Standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get things out of the house. And whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to these women who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Moreover, pray that when you flee, it will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation, middle seven weeks that Dan was talking about, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will again. And if those days had not been cut short or determined, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect of those days, it will be cut short. So if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or he's over there, do not believe him. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will provide great signs and wonders to us to mislead. If possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance, so if they say to you, behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe him. For just as the lightning comes from the east and the flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, where the vultures will gather. So this is for Israel. So he's talking about this desolation period, all right? So so people and, and you're going to have different you know viewpoints about what Jesus was talking about because we know in, in the AD seventy the, the the temple is destroyed. So if you t turn your page, there's two main guys who people say, well. Maybe that's, this is what Jesus was referring to, okay? And this is important to know because Jesus said there's never going to be anything like this again. Okay? The, the world has never seen what's coming up here, okay? That's what he says. No one's, you, you've never seen this. So there's two people here, okay? There's an Antiochus IV, and then there's a Titus destruction of the temple. Okay, so Antiochus IV was... 167 years or 170 years before Jesus, okay? Jesus was answering questions about when things will come. Okay, so he, he can't be referring to this point because he's, that doesn't make any sense, right? He's saying when would these things come? It didn't happen 167 years before. But something similar happened. So it's very fresh in the Jewish mindset that the abomination of desolation, something did happen in 167. This is what caused the Maccabean revolt. revolt. You ever heard the Maccabees? The Apocrypha book? I don't know. It doesn't matter if you ever hear it. This is why Hanukkah exists. Hanukkah? You know, we all know Hanukkah, right? Christmas time, Hanukkah. This is why Hanukkah exists. So what happened here was this guy, he goes, he goes into Jerusalem. He wants to conquer everything. And he, then he stops all the grain. He doesn't let anyone practice the Jewish faith. The things that this guy did, I read it. I'm not gonna stay here because it's just the kids are too many kids. Actually, I told my older kids, okay, this is what this guy did to the Jewish people. I left. Marcus comes in, and, and the girls were crying. <laughs> there were tears in their eyes. This, what he did, was awful. 
And why I'm saying this to you is that Jesus is saying, in the future it's going to be worse. Right? This guy was terrible. He had even sacrificed a pig on the on the on the, uh, the altar, which is an abomination, right? On the holy holies that the Jews can't have before. Or, so it was awful. But Jesus was answering about the question of a future event. There was no seven-year period. There was no pact. There was no treaty. There was no anything. There was no covenant made. And it didn't last the seven years. But it was a type of antichrist, what happened. The abomination of desolation is very fresh in the people, in the Jewish mind. Okay, And Hanukkah exists because of that. 35 years after, well, 35 years after Jesus was crucified, the temple is destroyed. Titus comes in, he destroys the temple, he destroys everything. He didn't want to destroy the temple, but his men started destroying it, and, and, and yeah, the temple was finished forever. There was no pack of treaties. So why this can't be the prophecy? There was no pack of treaty or covenant made with anybody for seven years. The desecration of the Holy of Holies was not exactly the same. No, no so it, it was just it was desecrated because it was destroyed, right? But no one set up themselves as to be God, which Antiochus did. The end didn't come, and it didn't last a prescribed time. And Jesus is talking about a future event, so even though this was future, all those things kind of doesn't make sense, doesn't fit. And remember, for prophecy, it's amazingly accurate, okay, like the details. We might not understand it now, but when it happens, and when we read what happened in the past, it's, wow, that's pretty accurate. You know, that, that's, we didn't know, so it's pretty amazing. So, so Jesus talks about this tribulation, so now we're going to go into Revelation, the last part. Okay, and I'm trying to make a point here that the seven-year period, one seven, is throughout the scriptures. And again, we're going to look in uh, Revelation. And, and I just selected three. There's a lot. Okay, so I just want to select three. We'll be here all day. <laughs> so the Revelations, in the end book, from 6 to 17, it talks about the Great Tribulation. It talks about, it describes in detail the seven your period. And why I say seven, well, we're going to be looking at it a little bit now here. It starts with the Antichrist, okay? And I just, this is an interesting point. Something that I kind of knew, but I didn't know until I was studying for this. You know, the four enforcement of the apocalypse? It's, it's in all movies and stuff like that. Anyways, it's contemporary, so don't look at me like I'm an old dude here. But the four enforcement of the apocalypse is like in the movies, right? It's even in the X-Men at one point. Anyways, um, the first guy is the, is the Antichrist, and we're going to read that here, okay? So then I saw the Lamb, Jesus, broke one of the seven seals, in verse 6, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it on a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. This is the counterfeit Jesus, because Jesus, in chapter 20, uh, 19, he comes in on a horse, but he has a different crown. The Steph, this, this crown is a Stephanos crown, and that's a crown of conquering. You go back to Daniel, breaks the seven, stops everything. Jesus says, this guy's going to come, and it's going to be really, really bad. He's going to destroy you all, so you run, because it's going to be, you got to go. All right? The mid-tribulation is talked about in the chapters 10 to 14 and 17 in Revelation. And so you can read it, it's in your, it's in your handout. Verse 11. Then there was given to me a measuring rod, like a staff. And someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar, and those who worship it. Leave up the courtyard, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, because it has been given to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. 42 months. Interesting. Why 42 months? I don't know. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. What's 42 months? Three and a half years. So the mid of the seven, 42 months. Is it possible the Revelation is talking about this Daniel prophecy as well as what Jesus was talking about? So I'm trying to make that connection about the tribulation here. In verse 12 to 6, when the Antichrist breaks his covenant and he hunts down Israel, in verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there should be nourished for 1,260 days. 
roughly we know how many days that comes out to, right? Yeah. Three and a half years. So in the middle of the seven. And then to finalize this midpoint, this three and a half year business, in Revelation 13, five to seven, and he's talking about the Antichrist. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshiped the dragon because he gave the authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? It was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. Sounds like the desolation of uh, abomination maybe. And the authority to act for 42 months, three and a half years. He opened up and he opened his mouth in the blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle that those who dwell in heaven. <laughs> so the purpose of today was just to show you that another piece of the puzzle is this tribulation. It's a seven year period, I think, I believe. It's corroborated well collaborated throughout the scriptures. And it's a period that we're going to be talking about maybe in a year time when I get finally to the end of this series. <laughs> we're going to be putting it all together, okay? Now, we're, I want to end this. People sometimes get a, a, a bad impression about the tribulation. Okay? They say, oh, how can God, it's always going to be punishing us. Da, 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 da. It's not that. The great tribulation in Revelation is going to harvest the greatest number of souls for Jesus ever. They're not going to be part of the church. I believe they won't be, but they're going to be, people who are going to be coming to salvation during this time. They will be persecuted like you wouldn't believe. If anyone thinks that we were going through the tribulation during the COVID period, guys, just read a little bit about Antiochus. There's no way. There's no way. This is terrible. Now, can it be set up? So what we did see is that, hey, wait a minute. Things can happen pretty quickly here. So I understand there is a, 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 an alertness about what happened, okay? And it's totally reasonable. But it wasn't the tribulation. But now, but we do see how it can happen. You know, all you need is a couple of media outlets, you need the government, and this will be illegal. Because we're teaching things that are very exclusive. So we can see that, how what happened, and all of a sudden civil rights were gone in Canada and other places. So we, but it wasn't the Great Tribulation. The vaccine is not the mark of the beast. Okay, that's I, I'm so certain. I'm, I don't say anything for certain, guys. I you know that. I know that it's not. It wasn't the tribulation, guys. <laughs> but it's good to be aware, and it's good to, to warn other Christians that we have to be. And, and there's a point in time where we have to fight against the government, and I'm not mocking that, okay? But we gotta be careful because the tribulation's gonna be awful. So the thing is, it, the purpose of the tribulation is to make the end of wickedness and wicked ones. It's a worldwide revival, man. It's gonna be amazing, okay? People are gonna be coming under tremendous duress. So don't wait till then, okay? Because if you think that was bad, what happened, that you couldn't buy your food or you couldn't go into, you had to wear a mask to go into a shopping mall, during the tribulation, that's going to be like, I wish that time had happened again, okay? So remember that. So don't wait for the tribulation. Do it now, guys. Put your, put your salvation into Jesus now. And the, I believe the Bible preaches that the church will not go through the tribulation. This is written for us to encourage one another so we don't go through the tribulation. And I think it's also for the tribulation saints. That they understand, you know what, there's going to be a hope here, but it's not going to be fun. All right, I believe we're the bride of Christ and he's coming for us soon. Well, soon. He's coming for us. The third point of the tribulation, okay, is centered around Israel. All right, it's to break, and I got the verses here that you guys can look at, it's to break the power of the holy people. And it's going to be three and a half years to do that. Break the power means to break your stubbornness. Now, there are Jewish people who are saved today, and you guys, they're just magnificent. Their understanding of the New Testament is fantastic. I love it. I just, oh, I didn't know that. But 
they know. But this, one of the smallest groups are you are Christian today. Something percent. They still rebelling in their heart against the Messiah, the stumbling block. At the end times, and I think we read this, they will call upon the name of the Lord, and Jesus will come. Jesus said that before he, when he was overlooking Israel, that how long did I come when you call me back? And he will come back and he'll save them. Okay, well we're gonna get that into later later. So today we did, we talked about the tribulation. Next time I'm going to be talking a little bit about the uh, messianic kingdom, the three judgments, and the resur and the three resurrections. And all I'm going to say is that this is what the scriptures say: do with it what you like. It talks about all these things. Now you don't have to believe what I believe, but I implore you to consider it and to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior because He's that's the our unifying grace here. Okay. So that, that's it for today. If you have any questions, you can come and see me. If you want to know how the concordance works, I really encourage you all become scholars of the Bible to get a concordance. When you read something, look it up. Do what Daniel did. You might be surprised what he, he found out, and you might be surprised what you find out. All right, so we'll close up in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your word. It's such an incredible, incredible piece of history and future and prophecy Lord we just thank you for for that and that we can trust it and we trust what it says about Jesus that you put your faith in Jesus you will be saved and we just thank you for those words in the Bible and we can rest assured about that in Jesus name Amen